you'll remain standing, I'd like to offer the scripture reading for our sermon today, 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, the living and active word of the Lord. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the one who has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Thus far the reading of God's Word and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, according to your kindness, I ask that you will allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts to be pleasing in your sight. For we are your children, and we long to bear your name honorably. Through Jesus we pray this, and amen. amen. You may be seated. John has a great deal to say about love, and he is not alone. We are surrounded, practically catechized by messages and comments and definitions of love. This is true in our day, and this is not new to our day. So here we are with another sermon in 1 John and another message with the word Love in the title. Three weeks in a row. I guess I could have clumped them all together and offered a rather longish sermon, but instead I've sliced them up and offered three. Two weeks ago, the sermon title was First Love. In that sermon, we pointed out God's preceding love which is prior to any love from us. This first love of God to us is abundant. It is prodigal. It is excessive. And it comes upon the unworthy, and it changes us, enabling us to love in response. That's first love. Last week, the sermon title was to love others, even them, speaks to that response that is to come from us. The preceding love of God to us is to result in the love of God from us to His children, to the one another's. Yes, those others who are a lot like us, unlovely, unworthy, undeserving, even them. Today, love does not mean anything goes. John connects love to God's commandments. They are companions. They are friends. They travel together. There are limits with love. Love is not some loose and oozing idea. So here's the summary. God's first love to us, that love then goes out from us to even them, and now love is not an open menu. It is not a blank slate where you just get to fill it in. And those three points are found in the verses before us. John, re is, it's a recurring theme in John. He keeps bringing it around again and again. So take a look at the verses we just read. Verse 1. 
Verse 1, if you're a believer, that is, if you have faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, that means you have been born of God. You have new life. God is your Father. And this was accomplished by His love upon you. This then, according to verse 1, results in love for the Father and for others who are children of the Father. Verse 2, we find out that this is not vague or foggy or cloudy. This is recognizable. This is seeable. This is knowable. How do we know? John says, verse 2, by this. By this. As we love those who are born of the Father, the children of God, this reveals our love for God. How? Well, because... God said to do this. We observe his commandments. So that's the love going out from us to the one another's. Then, verse 3, God's love is made known. Uh, it is known and shown. Verse 3, for this is the love of God. Yes. What is the love of God? That we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. They are not severe, stern, heavy, weighted. We want to do this because of the love of God. We lean into it. We want to because God has changed our wanter. John connects love with the commandments of God. Love does not mean just anything goes. Love has boundaries, guardrails. Love is not a shape shifter or something constantly bendable like a gumby or a pokey or a wax nose. The fact that love is a command likely speaks to a number of concerns which might have burbled up whenever we lace up our shoes and head out to go start loving the one another's. We might readily encounter a little bit of the itchy and scratchy if we believe the idea that loving that person means giving full acceptance and approval to what's going on. That's hard to love there. In other words, if we are told that love means anything goes, we're going to have some issues, some hesitancy, some things are going to burble up. If that was the case, that love just allows anything to go, my parents would not have loved me and corrected me and shaped me and trained me and disciplined me. There are all kinds of ideas and notions out there about love. We are inundated with messages, movies, and music swirling about telling us what love is. I will go ahead and admit right now that so many of those views contribute to all kinds of tainted love. Some are quick to conclude that love allows everything such that now to merely say something contrary is labeled unloving. So a sermon that says love does not mean just anything goes is likely considered unloving. Sermon on love that is unloving. Yet, love is a command given by God. If God, who is love, is not allowed to address or define love, then all kinds of things will fill the void. 
We should not be surprised then that many odd ideas about love pop up because there has been a turning around of the biblical teaching on love. The biblical phrase, God is love, in our day has been flipped over to love is God. And when this happens, my love becomes ultimate. My love is the standard. My love becomes God because in this twisted way, love is God. And you can't tell me what to do. You cannot even suggest right or wrong because after all, it's my love. You can't even speak against my loves, even if you think they are tainted loves. Common pushback in this. We might hear, you might hear that, oh, okay, so God loves sinners, and you, Christian, represent God, so you're supposed to love me just the way I am. And we have a hesitant and elongated, yes. The concern is if that idea of love brings with it the cargo that it's never expected to change. It never allows for change. Here's a news flash. The Lord's love for me was given because the Lord did not approve of everything in my life. Same is true for you. Because the Lord has come to claim sinners, the, the, the sick, the broken. It is true that the Lord loved me as I was. But thankfully, the Lord didn't leave me as I was. The Lord, according to Romans chapter 5, says the Lord loved me while I was an enemy. Biblical love does not blindly approve of everything. Biblical love, in that sense, is not blind. Biblical love is not blind to right or wrong, to wisdom or foolishness. Biblical love includes discernment. The Apostle Paul says that love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Who's to say what unrighteousness is? Biblical love is not blind to my, one's own limitations. Biblical love is not blind to the restriction of my own perception that I am always right. Or that because I'm doing this and I've called it love, then it must be loving. Love as a command is something from the outside. Love as a command is not of our own definition, and this should cause us to be humble. Lord, what is it? I'm not in charge of it. Lord, what is the command? Speak for your servant hears. Love as a command comes from, capital A, another. Love as a command is more than a feeling. Love is as a command, is not something you fall into. And because it is a command, it exposes the lie of, you know, I'm just not feeling it. Or, i got to feel first before I do. No. Love is a command, and we all know this. It's throughout 1 John. It's an old commandment. It's a new commandment. Here's the command. Love your brother. Believe in Jesus, it's command. But you'll also remember that Jesus was one time, cha one time challenged by a, 
a lawyer in the Gospels. A lawyer came and asked a question, uh, Teacher, what is the great commandment? And Jesus answered, You shall love, love, here's the commandment, the great commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And, and by the way, the second great commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Commands, love God, love one another. So here we are. In simple summary, not quite finished, first love given to us. Then we are to love others, even them, and then we wonder about that. We scratch our head and we say, hmm. Then we find out that because it's a command, it doesn't mean that just anything goes. Stop right there. This goes for us, too. Love doesn't mean just anything goes. This goes for us, too. I don't want to get into this and just treat all the ideas about love that are out there and our bad medicine as some kind of personal punching bag. We may have some false notions, too. I'll give you a quick one here in passing. No extra charge. While Christian love is distinctive, it is not agape. What? Here's another one. Christian love is more about doing than simply being described. Christian love is more active than it is adjectival. And Christian love does not go around dropping the hammer on others, on everyone, and everything, at every opportunity, especially upon fellow Christians. As if that's the way the Lord expressed his love to us, we have our own ways of giving love a bad name. We do. Some, perhaps, it appears and it is possible to pound others down in every disagreement. And to do so under this banner. Well, I love truth. And I got to fix that on my timetable. As if I am God. Some seem to be stuck on one thing. And it could be a bumper sticker stuck to them. Proverbs 27.5. Because they love truth. They'll also say, better is an open rebuke than love that is concealed. I'll not conceal my love. That, that, that is in the wisdom literature, yes. But so is this. The righteous always ponders how to answer. And where does love ever cover a multitude of sins? And whatever happened with Galatians 6, 1? If you encounter someone who is tangled up in a trespass, if you're spiritual, if you're going to follow Christ, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. And look out for yourself lest you also be tempted. Rather than just barging in going, i got to fix that because I love truth and I see what needs to be done. Biblical love does not mean just anything goes. Christian love always gives room for the grace of God.
Christian love of one another doesn't always defend itself. And Christian love of one another sometimes just shuts up. Do recall that our Lord did not respond to everyone who spoke against him. 1 Peter 2, 23, when he was reviled, he didn't revile in return, but he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. That was our Lord. And I certainly do not have his toolbox. So I'm going to conclude with two points and then give you a benediction. Two points. All of this is difficult. It requires wisdom and humility. This is not instant oatmeal. This takes time in the school of Christ and in the classroom of the body of Christ. This takes time in the school of Christ and in the classroom of the body of Christ. And this always reveals my inadequacies. Yours too, because not one of us does this just right. And these inadequacies in our love of the Father and our love of the Father's children always point us to the one who does it just right. That's the first point. Second point. When this is done, even with all of our flubbing and failing, there is no community anywhere like the community of Christ's people. Nowhere. The last two verses of our passage refer to this as they mention an overcoming of the world, I would like to summarize those two verses we read just a few moments ago. Here we go. The love of which John speaks shows life from God, and this new life overcomes the world. The world just doesn't get it. And sometimes if we've listened to them, we're going, I just can't go there. We need to be biblically informed because not just anything goes. The world just doesn't get it. What kind of a world are we referring to? We need to be honest with John's letter. The world could be that world of opposition against the Lord. That's the world saying, you know what, all of that stuff is foolishness. It is moronic. They're in opposition to God. Or it could very well be the world of Old Covenant Judaism, which is in opposition to the manifestation of the love of God by rejecting Jesus Messiah. They're anti-Christ. They reject Jesus all the while they claim to have Abraham as their father. And John is saying, well, then you don't have God as your father. They reject the Son of the Father, and they reject those who embrace Jesus, who is the Son of the Father. We've been placed here by the love of God. We have God as our Father, and we are to love His children. And we do not do this perfectly, and every time we do, do not do this perfectly, it is because it is a reflection, a dim reflection of the one who does it perfectly. Our lives, even in our failures, keep pointing back to the Savior. So now, receive this benediction. May the Lord, by His Holy Spirit, enable all of us to do and not do what is pleasing in His sight, and this to the glory of His name, and amen.